Sometimes we wonder, in this dark world, can powerful conversions and healings come through imperfect Catholic families like ours? Today's guest, veteran homeschooler Jess Echeverry, is here to tell us how her broken life was transformed through the healing power of the sacrament of matrimony. Don't miss this. Welcome to Homeschooling Saints, the podcast that helps you create the homeschool you love for the people you love. Our host is Lisa Maladnik, a Catholic life coach, TV host, best-selling author, and an instructor at Homeschool Connections. Welcome, I'm your host, Lisa Maladnik. Today we're talking about the healing power of the sacrament of matrimony, and our guest is a wonderful lady. Jess Echeverry is a women and family advocate and speaker. Her personal testimony is a survivor's story of physical and sexual violence, teenage pregnancy, years of off, on and off homelessness, abortion, same-sex attraction, and two attempts at suicide. But most importantly, Jess's story, now available in her new book, Dazzled, is about mercy, conversion, healing, and profound forgiveness. In 1997, Jess met the Catholic man she would eventually marry, and this man would help her create an environment of authentic love that enabled her relationship with Jesus Christ, her journey of healing, and her eventual forgiveness and love for her attackers. She converted to Catholicism in 2008. Her husband, Charlie, is now a permanent deacon for the Archdiocese of Los Angeles, and together Deacon Charlie and Jess have five children, two of whom were homeschooled for seven years. Jess is the founder and executive director of SOFISA, a nonprofit ministry serving Southern California homeless and low-income children and their families since 1999. She's also the inaugural recipient of the One Life LA Service Award for 2020. Find Jess Echeverry and her new book, Dazzled, at momaletics.com. That's in the show notes. And her nonprofit also will be found there too, www.sofisa.org. Welcome to the program, Jess. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Oh, yeah. It's really a joy and an honor because I've been reading your book and you had a really powerful conversion and came into the church in 2008. And just recently now, your book has come out, so people are going to want to get a, uh, get a hold of Dazzled. But give us some background first on where you came from so that we can get a clear picture. Uh, I know we don't have a ton of time, but then step us into what drew you to the Catholic Church. Yes, of course. Well, first and foremost, I'm obvious, I obviously wasn't Catholic. I wasn't raised Catholic. Um, actually, In my household growing up, there was no religion or prayer or talk of God. All of my exposure with Jesus and and God um, came from outside, you know, a couple of family members that had, you know, were uh, Protestant, were really impactful for me. But as I grew older and experienced what I experienced, I believed there was a God, but I didn't think God was for me. I didn't think that what I went through, I come from a broken and blended family. Um, I suffered child sexual molestation and rape at ages 10 and 12. And, you know, that led to a very rebellious teenage years at 14. I was a runaway and just creating havoc in my home. By 16, I was pregnant and homeless. 18, I was I experienced abortion, you know, by 20, I had, com- I had attempted suicide twice. And so it was a very tormented and, and trauma filled childhood experience. Obviously not every single moment, but some big things. And so by the time I was 20, yes, I believe God existed, but he just wasn't for somebody like me. And, and I honestly didn't want anything to do with them because if he was this all magnificent thing and he was so wonderful, why did all these things happen to me? And then by the time I was 21, I was pregnant with my third child. And shortly after that, I met my now husband, Deacon Charlie, and it, we're so different. (laughs) 
we are so different. Um, his childhood was the complete opposite. It was, you know, he came from an intact home. His mom and dad, um, as soon as, you know, when they were married, they stay married until his dad passed in 2015. And, um, and they were, they're Catholic and they raised their family Catholic. And so that foundation was set in him. For the most part, he had a tremendous childhood. He had wonderful experiences. Um, his family wasn't perfect, but it, you know, it practiced the Catholic faith and it stayed intact, which is super, super important for the formation of children. But I didn't realize that until I fell in love with him and we got married and we created a household of our own. It was like his life was being held up in front of mine. And that was the first time that I had, ex I had looked at my life and said, wait a minute, you know, things could have been different. Um, we have such different experiences. And that's when the truth of what I went through kind of hit me like a ton of bricks. And I realized this is what I thought was normal because in all of that, I'm surrounded by other people who have the same experiences. And so I never really thought much about what I had been through. I just thought that's what life was until I met my husband and um, started learning more about his experiences. Yeah. And I just want to pause for a moment as a reader of your book and just kind of footnote here that because you were going through your life so wounded and so like without a support network or any framework for God's love or his mercy, you were traveling life with other people in that same place, people who were being devastated by life. And so God's hand in drawing you into this Catholic family is really extraordinary here, two completely different worlds. And I feel like when we travel in a world of goodness and stability, that world of instability and total suffering is invisible to us. So here you and your husband now come together to make a marriage. Wow. Yeah. yeah wow. <laughs> <laughs> it was a wow. <laughs> it was. I mean, as a child of divorce, that was the big thing that I struggled with. And when things got rough, there was just this thing inside of me that said, leave, right? It's, you know, we set examples for our children without realizing we set examples for our children, even without saying a word. And, and that's the formation that happens that we really should be aware of because it was, it made a huge impact on how I dealt with stress and in difficulty where he had the opposite experience, you know? I would be troubled and we'd argue and mostly about money or disagreement or communication. And I would be screaming at the top of my lungs using curse words and, and saying, that's it, I'm out of here. And he would just be calm and look at me like, you know, what are you talking about? You know, we, we're married, we're one. We, there's no separating us. We're one flesh. You don't walk out on the person you've made this promise to. And so that was different for me. It was just different, you know, and, and so it really stood out and it really impacted me. Um, and I learned, he taught me, it was that type of love that he gave me. It was that environment where I could throw a stapler at him and <laughs> we laugh about it now. We laugh about it now. <laughs> Early in the beginning, um, <laughs> throw a stapler at him out of just pure rage, you know, and he knew the rage wasn't towards him. He knew that it was just what my heart had suffered and he played football in high school, so he ducked really well and <laughs> didn't get seriously injured. In an How God prepares <laughs> us. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And then, you know, one side, it, it, it was like a tantrum. It was a rage tantrum. Then once all the energy was expelled and I just cried and collapsed, he was there. And he held me and he told me how much he loved me. And he told me that he was never going anywhere. And that was... That was huge for me. That type of connectedness and oneness with him is extremely healing. And that, um, when we got married, I wasn't a Catholic. We got married in 2002 and I married in the Catholic church. 
when we got together and started speaking about marriage, he said, look, I'm Catholic. You know, there's two non-negotiables for me. We get married in the church and our kids get a Catholic education. And look, I am so mesmerized by him. I'll do whatever you want to do at this point. <laughs> you know, you can tell me to dance on one leg and chirp like a chicken. Like I'm, I'm totally in, right? So I didn't have any problem with that. So we did get married in the Catholic church. I knew nothing. As a matter of fact, what I did know or think that I knew about the Catholic church was that it was membership only. I didn't believe in confession, confessing my sins to any man. It's between me and God, if I was going to do it at all. And you guys just love Mary way too much. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I'm supposed to love Jesus. If I'm going to commit to this and do it, I'm supposed to only love Jesus and God. And so I had huge obstacles up as far as the Catholic Church. But I did that. I did whatever he wanted. And I just, looking back, we find it very interesting. He was a cultural Catholic, we learned. Um, he was raised in the faith. His parents were very devout Catholics. And he kept that foundation within him all through life, which is w- what prompted him to say, look, these are the two non-negotiables. But he wasn't an actively, he wasn't living his faith actively. He didn't know the whys to what he was doing. And so I went through a healing process after we got married. The sacrament of marriage opened up many graces. I didn't know at the time, but looking back, that God started really applying his graces in my life and allowing me to seek out therapy. I, went, I was in therapy for seven years for all the traumas that I experienced. And after that, I felt like I had really healed I felt like I had gotten to a point in my life where, wow, this feels really good. This is the best I've ever felt. And, but something was missing. And so I started looking out in the world for it. I started thinking, you know, the world tells you, you, the power of you, like everything you need is within you. You just have to tap into it. And so that's what I was looking for. I ended up going to a new age you know, self-realization temple up in um, Pacific Palisades here in California. And I started just going there to the lake, just starting and meditating, trying to tap into that power, right? That the world is telling me that I have inside of me. And it was hard, you know, I, I felt like, okay, I'm healed, but I just can't find this power. I'm searching for it. And so one day when I was at the lake, I, they have a up, up, there's like a staircase up the hill and that's where their temple is. And the temple is shiny gold, like the top part of it. And it just started blinding me. And I thought, oh, you know what? I've been coming here for, for such a long time. I think I'm just going to go check out the temple. Like I've never been in there. It attracted me. And so I climbed up the stairs and I went in and there was nobody in there. And it was shaped like an octagon. And all the way in the back wall were these tapestries, at least eight feet tall. They were all hanging. And those are their six avatars. It's who they believed are the prophets. And when I walked in, there was Jesus. He was right in the center on one of those tapestries. And he, he came out of the tapestry. I mean, I know this sounds crazy, but he literally, like a hologram, he came out of the tapestry. And when he did that, my first thought was like, okay, I'm going crazy here. (laughs) You know, did I rub a plant outside the wrong way or what's going on? I'm hallucinating. And, but as soon as he came out, he basically said, welcome. I see you've met my friends. Um, And I just fell to my knees. I got filled so full of just what felt like the truth. Like I knew that what I was in front of was the absolute truth about everything. It was like a fullness And I fell to my knees and just tears started coming from my eyes. He looked at me and he said, you're searching for me. I'm who you're looking for. And then that was it. It was over. He was gone. And I'm just bawling like, oh my gosh, it's Jesus. (laughs) Here I am. Oh, for all this power and peace and, 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 you know, and it's him. And so, and then everything, now my mind is going, okay, where can I find him? 
And then I go back to my experiences. Oh, every time we would go to mass in the Catholic church, they'd always say, this is the body and blood of Jesus Christ. You know, my mother-in-law would say, this is Jesus. We have Jesus in the Catholic church. So my immediate thought was, I'm going to go to mass and I'm going to pay attention and I'm going to look for him. I'm going to find him because he's who I'm looking for. That's amazing. That's stunning. What what gets me is it, it occurs to me that Jesus said, "If you are lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth." You have never been lukewarm, have you? <laughs> <laughs> You're like a searcher, a truth seeker, somebody who's really passionate and real. And so, whatever pain you have carried, whatever as, as you call it in your book, deformity of your own sense of your human dignity that you have suffered, there was an ache, a hunger for truth. And I just feel like Jesus really responds to that. He just loves that. Yes, I agree. Amen. I, that's that's so true. And uh, you know, in that search, right for Jesus, because I knew now that that was the missing piece. I started going to mass. And so now, you know, we're in mass on Sundays and I'm looking at my husband saying, what's the cookie? You know, (laughs) why is he wearing a cape? You know, why are you guys smoking up the place? Like what's going on here? And where is Jesus? You know? And the thing is, is that my husband had been a Catholic his whole life but had a difficult time answering my questions, which is so not his personality. I always used to nickname him my encyclopedia because I could go to him and ask him anything and he'd know the answer, like just random stuff. (laughs) My husband's the same way. That's so (laughs) funny. (laughs) He's my brain. (laughs) Yes. Yes. So imagine the shock he felt interiorly when he was like, I don't know these answers. And so truth be told, this cultural Catholic now got ignited. You know, I want to know the answers to these questions too. One, because I want to be able to have an answer for you, but two, because I I don't know. And so we, God put us on this path of me asking like, you know, a three-year-old, why, 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 why? And him just a sponge ready to take it all in and learn it. And the funny thing is, is we went to a Catholic Answers Gala and he won a thumbnail drive of their Catholic Answers Live radio show, 10 years, I think, worth of the radio show. And he stuck that in and downloaded it on his iPod and just played it, played it. And, you know, over a few years, you know, just learned everything. You know, we opened the catechism. We talked about, you know, well, does the church believe this and why? And, it was just this journey for him of discovering the faith that, you know, the finding out what that foundation actually was holding up was what Incredible. that is. I, again, Gus, just God's provision. He God right at the right moment is like, here, here's a thumb drive. <laughs> <laughs> right. Did you know that salvation came in a thumb drive? <laughs> <laughs> did not know that. No, no, did not. <laughs> Listen up, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, that's amazing. So fr- from a kind of ordinary, devout, imperfect, but loving Catholic family came this good man. And this good woman comes together with this good man, and God starts to provide answers. And so you start to experience, as you said, the graces of the sacrament of matrimony. Step us into what followed. What, what are, you know, we know your husband's a deacon now, so, <laughs> so kind of fast forward into the development that has occurred since then. You're, you're both doing so much. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so. I became a Catholic in 2008. Um, I still felt the same about the Catholic Church when I converted. And so when I share my conversion story, I always say, you know, I just didn't believe. But because I had that experience with Jesus in that temple, I knew that that's where he was calling me to. So it was strictly obedience. I became a Catholic strictly through obedience and listening to what Jesus said. There is a psychological part to that, which is because I came from so much brokenness, God used that that brokenness experience to attract me to the church. I knew that if my kids were Catholic, my husband was Catholic, 
my in-laws were Catholic, you know, my immediate, my domestic church was everybody was Catholic except for me. So if I became Catholic, we became whole in a sense, in my heart, that's what drew me to it. That was the driver for me to make that decision was to feel that wholeness as a family, which I, I had an experience growing up. So God used that in order to get me in, so to speak. Um, and so, yeah, so when I converted, um, and came into the church, I had to have my first confession and I'm going in, not believing anything. I learned how to do it. You know, he's going to, when he puts his hand up, you're going to, that's when you're going to be forgiven and say this and say that. So it was very, just go through the motions for me. And so when I went in, I said there, because of my previous trauma, I'm, I'm deaf in my right ear. So I'm, you know, I'm leaning towards the screen waiting to hear. And I think I, I think the oldest living priest in the Catholic church and the quietest one was in that confessional with me because I couldn't hear a word that he said. And my heart started getting frustrated and angry. And I started feeling like, See, I knew it. I knew this was pointless. I knew there was nothing here. I can't believe I'm sitting in this box. I knew it, right? This spirit of defiance started coming into my heart. And then I remembered, okay, so then he got quiet. And I said, okay, this is the part where I tell my sins. And so I told my sins. And then I remembered my, you know, my sponsor saying, you know, when he raises his hand up, that's when you uh, do the sign of the cross and you're forgiven. And so at that moment, I saw his hand go up and I went to put my hand on my head. And at that moment, everything that that priest had said came into my heart. Ooh, everything. It was, and I just, it, again, it was like that experience in the temple. It was like everything that is absolutely true, I felt it was there. And I was so shocked that God could do that. I witnessed his power, right? That power that I was searching for myself, inside myself. He had shown me firsthand in this first um, confession that he put everything there. I knew exactly what the priest said. I knew everything about what I needed to know. And my heart was completely turned. It was a complete 180. I started to cry, you know, and I knew that there was power in the sacraments, especially a confession. I mean, I flew out of there. I think I embarrassed my sponsor. I was like, there was a line. I'm like, you have got to stay in line. Don't get out of line. You got to go in there. It's life changing. Okay. <laughs> so, um, wow. Yeah. So that was, and, and I ended up having throughout my healing process and up to the point where I am now, the majority of my healing has happened because of the graces received in the sacrament of confession, my confessing my abortion, which led me to a Rachel's Vineyard retreat and me claiming my motherhood of my aborted daughter, Esperanza, and the forgiveness of my attackers and abusers growing up. I mean, men, people that I used to dream about killing myself and burying and then spitting on their graves, that hatred that just burned inside of me, um, the sacrament of confession um, I had in 2013 at a homeschool convention. Um, we were listening to one of the talks and they had a line of priests in the back and just out of nowhere, you know what? I'm going to confession. And so I popped back there and just unloaded on the priest, all of my hatred for these people. And he looked at me and he said, do you love them? And I said, no. And he said, do you want to see them in heaven? And I knew that, again, the truth in this priest's eyes and in his presence, I knew that I was supposed to say yes to those questions, but my heart just wasn't there. But I said to him, I said, how the heck do I get to the yes? <laughs> You've got to give me something, you Great know, question. you've got to tell me the way. And he said, you pray. You know, and at first, you know, it was like, Mm, yeah. Okay. Set that aside. Can you just give me something more tangible, please? <laughs> but he just looked at me. He was like, you pray. When you have that feeling of hatred, you, you pray for them. When you have that feeling of anger, you pray for them 
right? You want good for them. And that was, you know, that's love. That's the true definition of love. I don't ever have to see them. I don't ever have to speak to them. I don't, I don't have to do any of that. I don't have to have a relationship. But in the desire of my heart, God is calling me to love them. And that is the key to perfect forgiveness, to, to forgive like God himself forgives. You know, that's Matthew 5, 48. You know, be perfect like your heavenly father is perfect. That's what that means, right? So it's, there's two, for me, there's two different meanings to Matthew 5, 48. You know, to be perfect as your, as your heavenly father is perfect. One is that means here, before we get to heaven, we need to strive for that perfection, right? Are we perfect? No, but we are, we are called to perfection. And so that means what do we do? We right our wrongs. We, you know, we live our, we try our best to live in holiness. How? Sacrament of confession, right? As Catholics, that's why we have that beautiful sacrament, the power in that sacrament. And then the second part of that scripture, Matthew 5, 48, is, you know, that's the reward. We will be perfect with our father in heaven, right? So it's twofold. It's where we are here and when we get to heaven. So it's that promise while we're here. So strive for it. And it's that reward, you know, you will be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Wow. Okay, so we don't have a ton of time left, but um, I know that you homeschooled for several years, that you, at, at what point in the process did you maybe start to see the graces of the sacrament of matrimony feeding into that, creating your own environment, your own foundational family for your children to have that wellspring? Like, what did that look like to you as it started to make sense to you? Well, I realized in my learning the Catholic faith, after I converted, that's when I started actually learning and taking the teachings seriously and trying to understand them and kind of grapple with them. I learned about the domestic church, and I thought that it had such a cute name (laughs) when I heard that. My household is a domestic church. Here I've lived my whole life thinking church was so separate than my existence. Then I become a Catholic and now it's this building that we go to on Sundays. But then I, you know, the another layer of that was peeled off and it's like, no, my home is a domestic church. You know, and it, it reminds me, and I, I talk about this in my book, Dazzled, you know, God chose to save the world through a family. He could have breathed, he could have blinked, he could have snapped his fingers and sent Jesus the Savior to us any way he wanted. He could have popped him down at 33, ready to go, but he didn't. He miraculously put him in Mary's womb. She carried him for nine months. You know, pregnancy is holy, right? And then she gave birth to him and his childhood experience was in a home with a mother and a father. That is a domestic church. That's how important our homes are, especially as homeschooling parents. You know, that again, you know, Matthew 5, 48, strive for that perfectness. But I think, at least for me in the beginning, I would look for the results, right? I was looking for fruit. Like, okay, if I'm doing this, I'm supposed to see really great kids, right? My kids probably shouldn't mess up because they're so holy. You know, (laughs) when people, when we go out places and they find out we're homeschoolers, they're looking for them to just be perfect. You know, they can't make (laughs) any mistakes and people even feel obligated to quiz them in math. For some reason, I experienced that (laughs) whenever we were out until people were homeschoolers, my kids would get math questions. Oh, that's hilarious. Yeah, I don't understand that. <laughs> but but it it took me a couple years to learn that I'm not perfect even though I'm striving for it. And the importance of my my husband's childhood is the reason why I am where I am today. So it is you you teach the faith, you live the faith, right? That lived example, live the catechism right? And your children, you will set that foundation inside of them. You know, that's the scripture. I believe it's Proverbs, you know, train a child in, in, you know, in the ways of the Lord. And when they get old, they'll return to it, right? So God is basically saying, stop looking for the fruit right now. You know, stop trying to see 
you know, what I'm doing with your children right now. As a matter of fact, stop trying to see it at all. I'm doing that with them. You just do what I'm asking you to do, right? (laughs) And so in learning that, it really took a lot of stress off of me as a homeschooling mom, thinking everything had to be perfect. Yeah. And just to pull that golden thread one more time, the matrimonial graces of your husband's childhood created this foundation, this imperfect but beautiful domestic church. And out of that then came other graces and the graces of your own matrimony and his being able to stand in, I want a Catholic marriage and I want a Catholic family, even though he didn't know what he didn't know. And, and God's provision along the way, everything from your husband's ability to duck a stapler to, uh, <laughs> to winning a thumb drive at just the right moment. It's hilarious. God is so funny. And, and even that experience of deafness in the confessional, I feel like there's such a powerful symbol there. I could just think about that all day long, not being able to hear something, and, but God made sure you had it. God provided what you needed in that moment. And I love how lit up you are. It really comes through in the pages of your book. And that book, everybody, is dazzled. And it's, it's available at Jess's website. So that's all in the show notes. I'm also going to pop the two scriptures in there too, Matthew 5, 48. And I believe it's Proverbs 22, 6. You train your children up and then when they are old, they will not depart from it. I always laugh at that one because he says, when they're old, they won't depart from it. There may be some <laughs> side trips along the way. <laughs> Try not to panic. Yeah, that's like, that's like my mantra these days. But uh <laughs> oh, Jess, this has just been so beautiful, and we'll, we'll have to have you back another time. I love the way God speaks through you, the way you are so um, just open to his leading and the way you seek so powerfully. I think we all need to stand in that, that as imperfect people, we are making domestic churches here with God, and that amen. we can trust that, right? Yes, amen. Our job is important, and it's holy. And we're going to mess up and, and that's okay. Just keep striving for that perfectness. And as Catholics, use the sacraments that God has given us to get us to that holiness. Definitely. Amen and amen. All right, everyone. Thank you for being with us. We really just so appreciate your listening in. We are praying for you. Please pray for us too. And, uh, and again, check out the show notes for where to find Jess, her book, and her beautiful ministry to the homeless. God bless you, everybody. Hello, my homeschooling friend. I'm Celeste Behe, and this is the Homeschool Housefly. You know, my family's 30 years of homeschooling have had their share of ups and downs. From his spot on the wall, Frankie the housefly has witnessed some fails that were so embarrassing, I had to bribe Frankie not to tell them to anyone. Look, Frankie, keep this to yourself, and that bruised banana is yours. Deal? But there were successes too, like our early reading lessons. Now, when it comes to teaching kids how to read, there's plenty of disagreement, even among experts, about which method is best. All I can do is tell you what has worked for us, and what's worked is phonics. The phonics method involves teaching the sounds that letters make, allowing the student to sound out the words on the page. There are a number of phonics programs available, but the only one my family ever needed was Samuel Blumenfeld's Alphaphonics. All nine of my kids learned to read using Alphaphonics. The entire program was contained in one inexpensive paperback book. And the book itself looked like something you'd use for handwriting practice, just black print on a white page with no distracting colors and images. The best part? Each daily lesson took only 15 to 20 minutes. And Alphaphonics was so effective and worked so well for us that over the years, we bought extra copies just to give them away to new homeschoolers. But no matter which teaching method you use in your homeschool, your kids will one day be reading on their own. And then 
I hope you'll give them the faith and freedom readers to hone their new skills. The Faith and Freedom books are Catholic readers, written in the 1940s and 1950s, and recently reprinted. They are filled with stories that kids love and that parents appreciate for their focus on virtue. I myself learned to read using the Faith and Freedom readers, and guess what? I still have the reader that contains the crayon scribble that I made in second grade and that my teacher, Sister Anita, wasn't too happy about. But I digress. The Alpha Phonics program and the Faith and Freedom readers combined to make an excellent early reading curriculum for my family. I hope that you'll consider trying them out in your homeschool. And then, please let me know how it worked for you. I'm Celeste Behe, and this is the Homeschool Housefly. That's our show for today. Our program is sponsored by homeschoolconnections.com, where you can get online courses for your grade school, middle school, and high school student. Learn from the experts and make your homeschooling easier. Be sure to leave a review and share this podcast with your friends. And we'll see you next time here on the Homeschooling Saints podcast.